Okay, welcome to Spine Conference. Um, today's discussion will be running and degenerative disc disease. So, uh, like always, um, uh, if you have any questions, just um, interrupt me. So, today's um, today's question is: Is running detriment detrimental for low back pain? And um, this is a this is a personal quest of mine because um, I have low back pain and I run all the time, and um, my brother keeps telling me you should stop running. So I decided to look into it. And running is very popular, and, um, although it's getting a little less. I didn't know this. It's getting a little less popular. It peaked in 2013, but still, was at 17 million people um, finish a running event. So probably even more than that run, maybe 20 million people. So probably 10% of the population runs regularly. So it's a very common exercise, and it's it's. Uh, I mean, I think it's very good. So just I'm going to go over the spine first, and then we'll talk about running. Just just to go over the details of the spine, so you can understand the spine. The spine is is a column of many bones. Uh, and they go um, vertical, they should be straight, and they be, in between each bone is a disc, a cartilaginous tissue. So you can see in this young woman the flexibility that some people can have with their spine, uh, and that's the major function. Good morning, Dr. Allen. Good morning. That's the major, that's the major function of the spine is uh, flexibility. Um, so today's uh, discussion will be um, running and degenerative disc disease. Um, so what, what comprises the disc? The disc, um, the main two features of the disc is um, the inside part, which is nucleus pulposus, uh, and the outside part, annulus fibrosus. And the, the, the important thing is um, they're different. Uh, the, two characters, the two characters of the anatomy are different, and they occur in a continuum. So um, it's not... The annulus fibrosis doesn't stop at a border wall and then it becomes nucleus fibrosis, fibrosis, uh, nu nucleus pulposus. There's a somewhat of a continuum. And if you look at the um, gross anatomy, the inside part, nucleus pulposus, is very hydrophilic and resists uh, compressive forces, as you can see. And the outer portion is uh, resists tensile forces, annulus fibrosis, and is very tough. Um, now this that this this is a totally normal disc uh, in a very young person, probably died in a car accident, etc. This is a, a person with a degenerative disc, and you can see the middle part, the uh, nucleus pulposus, does not have as much water. And if you stain uh, this disc, um, so the top one is a, a normal disc or very very say very healthy disc. The bottom is a degenerative disc. There's not as much uh, glyco. Uh, uh, um, I can't say it now. Glycosaminoglycans um, uh, within the uh, nucleus pulposus. So um, inside the nucleus, hey, hey um, good morning. Uh, today, Doug, today's uh, discussion is degenerative disc disease and um, low back pain and running. So um, the cells within the matrix uh, make glycosaminoglycans and they stop um, making these proteins uh, as the disc degenerates. So the disc, um, you can grade it. Um, grade one is a very bright disc with a horizontal line. Um, grade two, um, the horizontal line's gone, is inhomogeneous. The signal gets less, then the signal's gone, which in the signal in the disc is from water, and then the disc slowly deteriorates. And the disc is made up of a cartilaginous end plate on either side, and in children, apophyseal ring. So the uh, ring part of the bone is where children grow. And they grow um, you know, up through the teenage years. I think at 20 it stops. And um, the uh, annulus and the nucleus and the cartilage all meet. The disc has no blood supply to it. So when we, when we take out the disc, it doesn't bleed, does it? It's like no blood supply. All the blood supply comes from the bone where it diffuses across the end plate. Um, so the inner structure is gelatinous, so like a jelly donut, and the outer part is uh, very tough, and the disc resists compression. 
the outer part, the annulus fibrosis, uh, consists of layers of collagen that are at 30 degrees, and they're at an angle that makes a total angle of 60 degrees. Um, and they're made like that on purpose to uh, resist tensile forces. Um, in the end plate of the vertebral body of the bone, there's a rich uh, anastomosis of uh, blood supply. This is in a child, and this goes away uh, around the age, of, I think around the age of like 13 or so. And that's why children can present with uh, discitis, like a, an infectious um, uh, uh, disc space infection. Um, I mean, when it, and it's different from um, adults that get discitis because there's no blood supply in adults. So you can treat a child with antibiotics, but an adult not so not so great because there there's not much of a blood supply um, to the disc space. Uh, so just to review, the chondrocytes, the cartilaginous tissue, have cells within them, and they make up a ground substance. Now within uh, cartilage is collagen, and collagen is the most abundant protein in our body. The type one collagen is what we find in skin and tendons and bone and ligaments. And type two is what we find mostly in cartilage. And the, the, the glycosaminoglycans um, have a hy hyaluronic acid um, middle part, the blue thing there. And then there's these um, basically tendrils made up of chondroitin sulfate and keratin sulfate. So the thought is if you eat this stuff, it helps your cartilage. Um, I personally, I, I'm not so sure that works. What, do you, what are your thoughts, Doug, about that? If you eat chondroitin sulfate, it will help your cartilage. There's a massive industry. Exactly. So it's like eating, if you eat cow eyeballs, it will help your vision. It just, it just does, it just, <laughs> it just, <laughs> human eyeballs. It's just not, <laughs> it's not logical. It's not logical. And if you read, if you ever, Really? Oh, it's a massive industry. Chondroitin sulfate, massive industry. Huh? Yeah. Well, you know, people, when it comes to vitamins, people are very emotional about it and have very strong opinions. I mean, and so I, I just don't get into it. It's like politics or religion. I just step away from those and uh, I'm not sure. I, like, you know, that's my, but it, 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 the only thing I tell patients, it, if it hurts your pocketbook, don't do it. I mean, that's the biggest thing. I don't want people unnecessarily spending their money. Um, well, I mean, some people don't have the money to afford it. Yeah, but still. Uh, yeah. Yeah, but this is different. Is that People take this medicine with the thought that it's going to help them. And, and they shouldn't do that if they can't afford it. I mean, if they can afford it, no, no problem. It's just like eating vitamins that may not hurt, you know, won't hurt. Okay, so that's my political discussion. Conjuring salt and carotin sulfate. Um, so the discs made up about make up about a quarter of the length of your spine. And um, personally, I think that's how people lose height as they get older. Does anybody disagree with me? I don't think it's through the bones. I think it's through the discs. That's why um, I've, I've lost like an inch of height. Um, yeah. No, I'm, I'm never going to. I'm never going to eat chondroitin sulfate ever. Okay. So the annulus fibrosis, they call it a herringbone pattern. You can see this is the annulus fibrosis histology. And this is a herringbone jacket. And it's just, and this is a herring bone uh, fish, <laughs> which is where you get it from. So it just shows the angle of the uh, of the collagen structures. Why is the anus fibrosis important? Very, very richly innervated. This is uh, this is staining of fine um, nerve endings, which are the pain nerve endings in the disc. And you can see the middle is not innervated at all. The outside is very richly fib uh, innervated. The outside is the annulus fibrosis. So this explains why disc uh, injuries are extraordinarily painful. I mean, if you, um, Alan, have you ever had a, have you ever had back pain? It, it's when you get it, it's like the end of the world. It's incapacitating. <laughs> you probably have stenosis. 
<laughs> but when you have an annular tear, it's incapacitating. So the other, the other important thing is what loads the disc. So the lowest load of the disc is on the left, laying supine. Standing is really low. Look how low standing is. So standing is a very good um, uh, uh, position for your disc. And then you can see bending puts more, uh, more stress on the disc. Sitting puts a lot of stress on the disc. And, and slouching when you sit puts the most uh, uh, stress on your disc. This is from Nockamson's study from like 60 years ago or something. I, I always thought that too. I always thought fetal position was more uh, more comfortable. So this is a normal MRI. See see the discs have very bright signal and also like a black line going across it. Now the bottom disc is decreased signal, bulging somewhat. Um, and this you can see now many of the discs have decreased signal. The discs have decreased height, and they're eroding into the amplate somewhat. And when the discs deteriorate, they, um, they tear, the annulus fibrosis tear, and sometimes the inside gelatinous part can come out. So is disc disease common? The, the fourth, col the fourth uh, bar is degenerative disc disease. And, this, and the bottom is age group and percentage. So you can see the middle one, which is my age group, 59% of all people have degenerative disc disease. So degenerative disc disease is extremely common. And the next, the next age group, 60, 80, 93%. So almost everybody. But interestingly, not everybody. So, I mean, I have seen a case of a 90-year-old woman, uh, a Greek woman actually, who came to see me, had a normal MRI. And I was shocked. I, I thought, I, I, didn't, I didn't believe it. But it just goes to show you that some of it's genetic. Uh, and the risk factors for degenerative disc disease are uh, a waistline, greater than 40, or um, metabolic syndrome, uh, cigarette smoking, age, uh, uh, professions that put a lot of uh, uh, stress on the back or um, vibratory um, stress, uh, um, and uh, family predisposition. Um, atherosclerosis, so the same. Uh, the same risk factors that give you atherosclerosis give you degenerative disc disease. So I believe that it's um, it has to do with uh, the blood supply, the blood supply to the end plate. So when you lose the blood supply of the end plate, the cells in the discs die. The cells in the discs die. They stop um, creating the cartilage, uh, and then you lose the uh, the strength of the nucleus pulposus and the disc deteriorates. So, any questions about disc so far? I don't know if I, I did, I talked maybe a lot, but I wanted to give a, a understanding of what discs are. So running, now running, what is running? So running, I think, is the most efficient way to exercise because all you have to do is put on your shoes and walk out the door. It's just so simple and easy. And your heart uh, 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 has a good exercise, your lungs have good exercise, and it's a, it's a good impact uh, exercise, too, for your you know, musculoskeletal of the body. The problem is every time you strike the ground, your discs or your spine gets two to three times your body weight and force across it. So that's a lot of force across your disc spaces. Um, so this is the bottom is time of the stepping in the, and the, and the Y axis is the force. So you put a lot of force across the discs. Okay, another fact is at the end of the day, you lose about 1% of your height. So if you're six feet tall or 72 inches, if you measure yourself at the end of the day, you're 5'11 and one quarter. So basically at the end of the day, you shrink. And the thoughts are it's from the pull of the gravity on your discs tends to compress it. Um, yeah. No, I think, no, I don't, I don't think that's it. I think, I think it's, at, at that point, you, you're not, you know, there's no weight on your foot. You're just about to lift off. Mm -hmm. See what I mean? So that's that's all it is. Because you're basically, you're, at that point, when your toe's about to let go, you're basically flying. You're like a horse, all all the, all the your extremities off the ground. So when, oh, when your extremities off the ground, there's no force on your disc. Um, okay. So 
this is the British S. So, so I always thought like if gravity causes if gravity causes a lot of problems with discs, what happens with astronauts? I, do, I know this is a little bit of a side, but I've always been curious about this. And this is just an interesting fact I found that this British S astronaut Tim Peake ran a marathon in space during the London Marathon in 2016. He ran 26 miles on the treadmill. He did it like in three and a half hours. And um, so last year there was a study studying the spine in astronauts. Yeah, he was weightless. Yeah, you can see. Look, they have them. They have them strapped down. So I just, you know, it's it's interesting. This was studied. So the spine was studied in astronauts. This was last year, and they studied six astronauts, and they studied the intervertebral disc at the level of the L3, L4. And these are the astronauts that were in the International Space Station for six months. And the reason why they studied the astronauts is because when people go in space, uh, it changes their spine. They have four times the probability of getting a herniated disc uh, one year after they come back from space. And the highest probability is in the first month. Now, these specific astronauts um, exercised every single day on the space station between two and three hours. And they did treadmill. They did a stationary bicycle. And they did weights. They did what they called resistive weight training, which is basically either either free weights or a rubber band weights, or just strengthening exercises. Um, and um, in the past, studies have found that when the astronauts came back, they were five centimeters taller. So the thought was, why are they taller? The thought was they're taller through their discs because there's no compressive force. Um, now, normally the height variation uh, during the day, like we said, is like maybe a centimeter. So they studied these astronauts and they, they also studied, they took MRIs before they left, um, and the minute they came back, and then they also like two months later, after they've uh, been on Earth for two months. And they, they looked at the discs and they looked, looked at the muscles all around the spine. Um, and they call it the, the functional cross-sectional area. Basically, they, they measured the, um, the volume of all the muscles all around the spine. And what happens to the astronauts? The, the top one is the, the muscles. The muscles decreased in area by 19%, but then in six weeks, they mostly recovered, 68% recovery. So the muscles in the spine, despite all this exercise, significantly atrophied, uh, but then they returned almost to normal in six weeks. The bottom is the disc height. They measured the disc height, and they found that there was no change at all in the disc heights, which is contrary to, to uh, previous um, studies. So some people think maybe when they came back, they didn't have cervical lordosis, kyphosis, and lordosis, the curve, and they were just straighter. That's the theory. Maybe they just lost their curvature and then just normalized. I don't think so. Possible, yeah, I don't know. Um, okay, so this is another study. Moderate intensity morning causes uh, disc compression in young adults. So they took eight young subjects, basically men, between the ages of 18 and 23, and they had them run for 30 straight minutes at a, at a, good, at a moderate pace, 70% of their heart rate. And they got an MRI before they went for a run, and they got an MRI after they went for a run. And then they measured the disc volume. Uh, so they, took, they did MRIs, and you can see the top one. They measured the disc before they ran and after they ran. And what they found is uh, these, uh, these are the different disc levels. And you can see the lumbar discs are bigger than the thoracic discs. But the, um, the height decreased um, in all of them. And uh, the volume decreased, too, uh, significantly. Um, and these are the heights. So basically, they lost about 6% of the height of the disc. And they lost 6.9% of the volume of the disc by just running for... 30 minutes. So this is another study that was done at Duke where they took 17 young men between ages of 20 and 27 and 14, um, uh, what's 50? Middle-aged men, old? 14 old men. And they had them run. They had them run six miles on a paved um, uh, course, six miles at their own pace. And they measured from C7, you can feel C7, down to S2. They marked it on the skin. They measured it with a plumb line. And they measured it before and after they ran. And they found that they lost 
about just under, um, both lost the same amount of height and uh, just under a centimeter. So the, the young man lost 0 0.9 centimeters and the older man lost 0 0.7 centimeters. So running decreases the height of your discs. So there, there's, you know, pressure. So any, any questions so far about running? This is another study of rats. I know we're not rats, but we can kill rats. We can't really kill people to study them. So they took rats and they had a treadmill model where some rats were induced to run and, and the other ones did not at all. And um, they had them run for three weeks regularly. Um, 12, of them, 12 of the rats ran, the other 12 just watched TV. And then they uh, looked at their discs and they measured the cell count, the protein expression, apoptosis, like how many of the cells within the disc were dying, proteoglycan expression. And they found that the running rats had a 25% higher level of cells in their discs. And the running rats had a significantly higher uh, collagen expression and proteoglycan expression. And you can see these are the discs on the left. The blue is proteoglycans. These are the runners. And on the right are the um, TV watchers. So running is uh, very, very good for discs in rats. But uh, I think I think it doesn't have to be running. Personally, my theory is it's just uh, you know exercise. Sure <laughs> yeah. Well, I think it's aerobic uh, exercise. So this is just another interesting study of climbing. So they had patients with chronic low back pain, greater than three months, uh, and they had them climb. They had them on. A, I'll show you the climbing course. Well, I'll show you right now. Here's the climbing course. So it's basically uh, kind of like a mountain climbing course that they had, and they had people do this um, uh, regularly. So um, for 10 sessions over eight weeks um, and two groups, and this is a closed chain activity, um, which means the hands and the feet are in the same, um, are always uh, in the same place when you do the activity versus open chain like lifting weights. And so they had these people uh, climb, and then they, after about eight weeks and then 14 weeks, they asked them how they were doing, Oswestry Disability Index. And the climbers were much better than the non-climbers. So this uh, climbing exercise um, helped people with low back pain. And you can see like the, the lighter one is the climbers. They, they felt um, much more than, many more than felt better or much better than the non-climbers. So this is just another review article that I have there if you guys want. It's like, what, what are the best exercises um, or non-pharmacological therapies for low back pain? And the strongest uh, evidence were Tai Chi, yoga, and mindfulness-based stress reduction techniques. Um, now, in my office hours, there's no way anyone is going to go for mindfulness-based stress reduction techniques. I mean, that's just not my clientele. Maybe I'm not asking them to. Maybe if I ask them to, they'll do it. But I just don't, I'm just not sure if this is realistic. I mean, what are, you, what are your guys' thoughts about that? Oh, that guy. Yeah, I know who you're talking about. Yeah. For health. Yeah. Hard for two of the Yeah. I would say what I tell people is. Uh, I, well, I think. No, 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 no. There's some that are bad. There's some bad, like squats. Definitely bad. No squats, right? Squats are really bad for discs. Military press, not so good for your back. Deadlifts, asking for trouble. Power cleans, asking for trouble. I think. Yeah, but a lot of people do. 
A lot of yeah, a lot of people do that. So I think it's very bad for the discs. Unless maybe you, if you use very very light weights, it's probably okay uh, with these these uh, power clean. But these people they want to do like three hundred pounds when they do this. The the power clean. No, this is very popular for young people. Yeah, yeah. So I think at the the ex you can do all of the machines, but don't do heavy weights. Uh, maybe 20 repetitions. So that's lightweight. If you can do it 20 times, it's a pretty lightweight for you. And uh, and avoid those things we said. Overhead press, squats, even the leg presses, I think, are asking for trouble. But you can do all the other ones. The other thing is, I think, I think if you run on the treadmill, it's probably better for you to march with a very high incline, like they do with the cardiac stress test. Because that's that's the uh, the least pounding on your spine. So, and then the other question is, is it bad for your spine if it, if it collapses while you run? Because most, it may just be osmosis of the, of the water coming out of your disc and then it just, you know, reconstitutes. Not as much, not as much. Yeah, not as much. It's really good for your cell activity, yeah. You mean when your back hurts, you should still go to the gym. Yeah. Yeah. No, I agree. I mean, I mean, my personal philosophy is I is I do three things, and I do them because of my back basically. I swim, I lift, and I run. But I've been decreasing my running because my back's been hurting, so I just walk like vigorously, like hills and things like that. Um, and I think if you do those, I'm those swimming. are good activities. You swim. What else do you do? You got to do something that. It loads your body though. Like so, lift. Yeah. And um yeah, I'm just too old. But that Yeah, I mean, the number is not as important as the number of times you do it. So it's something that you can do 20. Yeah, but something that you do, can do a lot of, it's not heavy for you. Like, it's not maxed out. Like a, like a, uh, like a circuit. Yeah, yeah, those are fun. So they're more. I think you're more likely to do circuits because they're fun. They're different. Yeah. You don't get exhaust your muscles. Hmm? Yeah, yeah, those are good. That, that's how I lift weights. I lift weights in a circuit. And then the other, um, but the other most important thing for these people with low back pain is mindfulness. I mean, Tai Chi and yoga are things that quiet your mind. You don't know that. You don't, you don't know that. Well, that's the whole point is that you, you, you've got to work on it. The other thing about mindfulness is um, is it helps even though you don't think it's helping. And even if you think even if you think your mind is not quiet, it helps. So and it takes a very long time to be able to quiet your mind. Like they've, they've done these studies with uh, my wife was a, learned a lot about this because she studied a book on brain health. And they, and they found um there's a certain number of hours where you, you achieve the ability to quiet your mind. And they, and they have functional MRIs uh, tests for this where they, they put the, um, the, the, best, the best people at this are the monks. I mean, that's, that's their full-time job. And I think they say after like 10,000 hours, you can't get any better. Like these, they're maxed out for, um, for mindfulness and quieting their minds. And that just some, just trying to do that. And even if you're not, even if you don't think it's working, like Aaron says, nothing can quiet my mind. But if you try, it still helps. You see what I mean? Like it is working. Yeah, I don't know. I just threw that out there. But so, um, but the thing is, like, it, it it still helps. It still, even if you don't think it's helping, it is helping. Even if your mind's not totally quiet. But th this um, this one article found that these were the best activities, and then not as good, but still somewhat helpful are manipulation, physical therapy, massage. Uh, psychological counseling and acupuncture. Um, now, out of all these, 
I think physical therapy people will go to. They won't go to the other ones. Like they, they just half a count of people refuse to go to the other ones. They do. They do. Yeah, some. Some. So, so what are your thoughts about running? Do you think, do you think running is bad for you? If your back hurts. If you have a, if you're a middle-aged, right. No, just just a minute. I mean, back pain comes from something. There's no there's no magical back pain that only a sorcerer can solve. It's coming from somewhere. So back pain that people don't know where it's coming from in a certain age group, 95% is degenerative disc disease. Now that's different from a 15 year old boy who tackles and and strains and injures something else. Those are different human you know humanoids. So I'm talking about the average man who has back pain. That's usually degenerative disc disease. It's an inflammation of the yeah, but the average man who gets back pain. Um, or woman, you know. Yeah. Almost always. What is your theory? I have a theory. What is your theory? That why do people get why do people get better from back pain? I have a theory. What is your theory? No, it's 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 just like if I punch you in your arm really hard, it gets inflamed. It's right. It's an inflammatory process mm -hmm. that goes away. So you did something that inflamed this disease part of your body, and over time, inflammation resolves. That's what a, that my theory, and it so takes six weeks. It recurs. Oh, yeah, of course. Oh, of course. So you have the same disc in one person that's disabling another person doesn't bother them at all. So I think a lot of it is is just uh, it's the mind. The mind just perceives it differently. And these people, they, they do have pain. I mean, it's not, they're not making, they're not lying about their pain. They really do have this pain. Yeah. So um, it, it's just how the mind perceives it. Um, so that's why I think all these things like Tai Chi, yoga are very helpful. Yeah. So it improves. It, it, stiff people get better if you improve flexibility. A lot, a lot of it's fear is fear too. Fear people, moving, yeah. yeah, fear. People fear moving, and they stay stiff. So the therapist uh, helps them overcome that fear. I, I do that at post-op day two with spine fusions. They refuse to get out of bed, and I and I go there myself. That's why I learned my fellowship, and I just get them out of bed myself. And Aaron's like, "How did you get the patient?" I was like, "Cause I don't take no for an answer. You get out of bed. They get out. They, the surgeon, if the surgeon says get out of bed, 
you get out of bed because they're the ones that fix your back. They get out of bed, they realize, oh, I can do this. I'm okay. And then, yeah, and usually it's day one. And uh, um, they, I mean, day one, I get them up. Day two, I walk them. So they realize I can do this. And then they, you know, they don't have that fear. I think it helps. I think it helps. I think if I think if you can take an anti-inflammatory, you should. But some people can't take it. Like a lot of people just can't take anti-inflammatories. They're on blood pressure medicines. They have a heart disease. But yes, I mean, but that, so I didn't get into that. But this is like non-pharmacological. But yeah, I agree with that. Okay. So what do you, Alan? Do you think running running is good for you? <laughs> I had a personal trainer who made me run on the treadmill and I got a puncture in my arm. All right. Okay. Squash. squash is a very fun sport. You don't feel like you're exercising. You're just focused on that ball. Yeah. It's the best. It's what. It's a great sport. What? Squash. Yeah. Yeah. Aerobic. Yeah. I think aerobic, aerobic, a squash is is just as aerobic as wrestling. It's it's extreme. Because I'm Greek. But wrestling is very aerobic and strenuous. Yeah, that's true. It's true. All right. So, any other questions? All right. Thanks for coming.